Chapter 10 Just Grass in the Wind 1969 Sand keeps secrets better than mud. The sheriff parked his rig at the beginning of the fire tower lane so they wouldn't drive over any evidence of someone driving the night of the alleged murder. But as they walked along the track, they looked for vehicle treads other than their own. Sand grains shifted into formless dimples with every step. Then, at the mud holes and swampy areas near the tower, a profusion of detailed stories revealed themselves. A raccoon with her four young had trailed in and out of the muck. A snail had woven a lacy pattern interrupted by the arrival of a bear. And a small turtle had lain in the cool mud, its belly forming a smooth, shallow bowl. Clear as a picture. But besides our rigs, not a thing man-made. I don't know, Joe said. See this straight edge? Then a little triangle? That could be a tread. No, I think that's a bit of turkey print where a deer stepped on top. Made it look geometrical like that. After another quarter hour, the sheriff said, Let's hike out to that little bay. See if somebody boated over instead of coming by truck. Pushing the pungent myrtle from their faces, they walked to the tiny inlet. The damp sand revealed prints of crabs, heron and pipers, but no humans. Well, but look at this. Joe pointed to a large pattern of disturbed sand crystals that fanned into an almost perfect half circle. Could be the imprint of a round bowed boat that was pulled on shore. No. See where the wind blew this broken grass stalk back and forth through the sand, drawing this half circle? That's just grass in the wind. They stood looking around. The rest of the small half-moon beach was covered in a thick layer of broken shells, a jumble of crustacean parts and crab claws. Shells, the best secret keepers of all. Chapter 11. Crocus Sacks Full 1956. In the winter of 1956, when Kaya was ten, Pa came hobbling to the shack less and less often. Weeks passed with no whiskey bottle on the floor, no body sprawled on the bed, no Monday money. She kept expecting to see him limping through the trees, toting his poke. One full moon, then another had passed since she'd seen him. Sycamore and hickories stretched naked limbs across a dull sky, and the relentless wind sucked any joy the winter sun might have spread across the bleakness. A useless, drying wind in a sea land that couldn't dry. Sitting on the front steps, she thought about it. A poker game fight could have ended with him beat up and dumped in a swamp on a cold, rainy night. Or maybe he just got fall-down drunk wandered off into the woods and fell face first into the backwater bog. I guess he's gone for good. She bit her lips until her mouth turned white. It wasn't like the pain when Ma left. In fact, she struggled to mourn him at all. But being completely alone was a feeling so vast it echoed, and the authorities were sure to find out and take her away. She'd have to pretend, even to jump in, that Pa was still around and there would be no Monday money. She'd stretched the last few dollars for weeks, surviving on grits, boiled mussels, and the occasional remnant egg from the rangy hens. The only remaining supplies were a few matches, a nubbin of soap, and a handful of grits. A fistful of blue tips wouldn't make a winter. Without them, she couldn't boil the grits, which she fixed for herself, the gulls, and the chickens. I don't know how to do life without grits. At least, she thought, wherever Pa had disappeared to this time, he had gone on foot. Kaya had the boat. Of course, she'd have to find another way to get food, but for right now she pushed the thought to a far corner of her mind. After a supper of boiled mussels, which she had learned to smash into a paste and spread on soda crackers, she thumbed through Ma's beloved books, play-reading the fairy tales. Even at ten, she still couldn't read. Then the kerosene light flickered, faded, and died. One minute there was a soft circle of a world, and then darkness. She made an O sound, 
Pa had always brought the kerosene and filled the lamp, so she hadn't thought much about it until it was dark. She sat for a few seconds, trying to squeeze light from the leftovers, but there was almost nothing. Then the rounded hump of the Frigidaire and the window frame began to take shape in the dimness, so she touched her fingers along the countertop until she found a candle stub. Lighting it would take a match, and there were only five left, but darkness was a right now thing. Swish. She struck the match, lit the candle, and the blackness retreated to the corners. But she'd seen enough of it to know she had to have light, and kerosene cost money. She opened her mouth in a shallow pant. Maybe I ought to walk to town and turn myself into the authorities. At least they'd give me food and send me to school. But after a mi thinking a minute, she said, No, I can't leave the gulls. The heron, the shack, the marsh is all the family I got. Sitting in the last of the candlelight, she had an idea. Earlier than usual, she got up the next morning when the tide was low, pulled on her overalls and slipped out with a bucket, claw knife and an empty tow bags. Squatting in the mud, she collected mussels along the slows like Ma had taught her, and in four hours of crouching and kneeling had two croker sacks full. The slow sun pulled from the sea as she motored through the dense fog up to Jumpin's gas and bait. He stood as she neared. Hello, Miss Kaya. You wantin' some gas? She tucked her head. Hadn't spoken a word to anyone since her last trip to the Piggly Wiggly, and her speech was slipping some. Maybe gas, but that depends. I hear tell you buy mussels, and I got some here. Can you pay me cash money and some gas throwed in? She pointed to the bags. Yes, sorry, you sure do. They fresh? I dug em up before dawn, just now. Well then, I can give you fifty cent for one bag and a tank for the other. Kaya smiled slightly. Real money she had made herself. Thank you, was all she said. As Jumpin filled the tank, Kaya walked into his tiny store there on the wharf. She'd never paid it much mind because she shopped at the Piggly, but now she saw that besides bait and tobacco, he sold matches, lard, soap, sardines, Vienna sausages, grits, soda crackers, toilet paper, and kerosene. About everything she needed in the world was right there. Lined up on the counter were five one-gallon jars filled with penny candy, red hots, jaw breakers, and sugar daddies. It seemed like more candy than would be in the world. With the muscle money, she bought matches, a candle, and grits. Kerosene and soap would have to wait for another croaker full. It took all her might not to buy a sugar daddy instead of the candle. How many bags do you buy a week? she asked. Well now, we striking up a business deal? he asked as he laughed in his particular way, mouth closed, head thrown back. I buy about 40 pounds every two to three days, but mind, others bring them in too. If you bring them in, and I already got some, well, you'd be out. It's first come, first serve, no other way of doing it. Okay, thank you, that'd be fine. Bye, Jumpin. Then she added, Oh, by the way, my pa sends his regards to ya. That's so. Well then, you do the same for me, if you please. Bye yourself, Miss Kaya. He smiled big as she motored away. She almost smiled herself. Buying her own gas and groceries surely made her a grown-up. Later, at the shack when she unpacked the tiny pile of supplies, she saw a yellow and red surprise at the bottom of the bag. Not too grown up for a sugar daddy, Jumpin' had dropped inside. To stay ahead of the other pickers, Kaya slipped down to the marsh by candle or moon, her shadow wavering around on the glistening sand, and gathered mussels deep in the night. She added oysters to her catch and sometimes slept near gullies under the stars to get to Jumpin's by first light. The muscle money turned out to be more reliable than the Monday money ever had, and she usually managed to beat out the other pickers. She stopped going to the Piggly, where Mrs. Singletary always asked why she wasn't in school. Sooner or later they'd grab her, drag her in. She got by with the supplies from Jumpin's and had more muscles than she could eat. They weren't that bad tossed into the grits, 
mashed up beyond recognition. They didn't have eyes to look at her like the fish did. Chapter 12 Pennies and Grits 1956 For weeks after Pa left, Kyle would look up when ravens cawed. Maybe they'd seen him swing-stepping through the woods. At any strange sound in the wind, she cocked her head, listening for somebody. Anybody. Even a mad dash from the truant lady would be good sport. Mostly, she looked for the fishing boy. A few times over the years, she'd seen him in the distance, but hadn't spoken to him since she was seven, three years ago when he showed her the way home through the marsh. He was the only soul she knew in the world besides Jumpin' and a few sales ladies. Wherever she glided through the waterways, she scanned for him. One morning, as she motored into the cord grass estuary, she saw his boat tucked in the reeds. Tate wore a different baseball cap and was taller now, but even from more than fifty yards she recognised the blonde curls. Kaya idled down, manoeuvred quietly into the long grass and peered out at him. Working her lips, she thought of cruising over, maybe asking if he'd caught any fish. That seemed to be what Pa and anybody else in the marsh said when they came across somebody. Anything biting? Had any nibbles? But she only stared, didn't move. She felt a strong pull toward him and a strong push away, the result being stuck firmly in this spot. Finally, she eased toward home, her heart pushing against her ribs. Every time she saw him, it was the same, watching him as she did the herons. She still collected feathers and shells, but left them salty and sand sandy strewn around the brick and board steps. She dallied some of each day while dishes piled up in the sink and whitewash overalls that got muddied up again. Long ago, she'd taken to wearing the old throwaway overalls from gone away siblings. Her shirts full of holes, she had no more shoes at all. One evening, Kaya slipped the pink and green flowery sundress the one Ma had worn to church, from the wire hanger. For years now she had fingered this beauty, the only dress Pa didn't burn, had touched the little pink flowers. There was a stain across the front, a faded brown splotch under the shoulder straps. Blood, maybe. But it was faint now, scrubbed out like the other bad memories. Kaya pulled the dress over her head, down her thin frame. The hem came almost to her toes, that wouldn't do. She pulled it off and hung it up to wait for another few years. It'd be a shame to cut it up, wear it to dig muscles. A few days later, Kaya took the boat over to Point Beach, an apron of white sand several miles south of Jumpin's. Time, waves and winds had modelled it into an elongated tip, which, each, which collected more shells than other beaches, and she had found rare ones there. After securing her boat at the southern end, she strolled north, searching. Suddenly, distant voices, shrill and excited, drifted on the air. Instantly, she ran across the beach towards the woods, where an oak more than eighty feet from one side to the other stood knee-deep in tropical ferns. Hiding behind the tree, she watched a band of kids strolling down the sand, now and then dashing around in the waves, kicking up sea spray. One boy ran ahead, Another threw a football. Against the white sand, their bright madras shorts looked like colourful birds and marked like changing seasons. Summer was, summer was walking toward her down the beach. As they moved closer, she flattened herself against the oak and peered around. Five girls and four boys, a bit older than she, maybe twelve. She recognised Chase Andrews throwing the ball to the boys he was always with. The girls, tall skinny blonde, ponytail freckle face, short black hair, always wears pearls and round chubby cheeks, hung back in a little cove, walking slower, chattering and giggling. Their voices lifted up to Kaya like chimes. She was too young to care much about the boys, her eyes fixed on the troop of girls. Together they squatted to watch a crab skittering sideways across the sand. Laughing, they leaned against one another's shoulders until they flopped onto the sand in a bundle. Kaya bit her bottom lip as she watched, wondering how it would feel to be among them. Their joy created an aura almost visible against the deepening sky. 
Ma had said women need one another more than they need men, but she never told her how to get inside the pride. Easily, she slipped deeper into the forest and watched from behind the giant ferns until the kids wandered back down the beach, until there were little spots on the sand where they came. Dawn smouldered beneath grey clouds as Kaya pulled up to Jumpin's wharf. He walked out of his little shop, shaking his head. I'm sorry, I'm sorry as can be, Miss Kaya, he said, but they beat you to it. I got my week's quota of mussels, can't buy no more. She cut the engine and the boat banged against a piling. This was the second week she'd been beat out. Her money was gone and she couldn't buy a single thing, down to pennies and grits. Miss Kaya, you gotta find some other ways to bring in cash. You can't get all your coons up in one tree. Back at her place, she sat pondering on the bricken boards and came up with another idea. She fished for eight hours straight and then soaked her catch or her catch of twenty in salt water brine through the night. At daybreak, she lined them up on the shelves of Pa's old smokehouse, the size and shape of any outhouse, built a fire in the pit, and poked green sticks into the flames like he'd, like he'd done. Blue-grey smoke billowed and puffed up the chimney and through every crack in the walls. The whole shack was huffing. The next day she motored to Jumpin's and, still standing in her boat, held up her bucket. In all, it was a pitiful display of small bream and carp, falling apart at the seams. You buy smoked fish, Jumpin? I got some here. Well, I declare I sure do, Miss Kaya. I tell you what, I'll take em on consignment like. If I sell em, you get the money. If I don't, you get em back like they is. That do? Okay, thanks, Jumpin. That evening, Jumpin walked down the sandy track to Coloured Town, a cluster of shacks and lean-tos, and even a few real houses squatting about on backwater bogs and mud sloughs. The scattered encampment was in deep woods, back from the sea with no breeze, and more mosquitoes than the whole state of Georgia. After about three miles he could smell the smoke from cook fires drifting through the pines, and hear the chatter of some of his grandchildren. There were no roads in Coloured Town, just trails leading off through the woods, this way and that to different family dwellings. His was a real house he and his pa had built with pine lumber and a raw wood fence around the hard-panned dirt yard, which Mabel, his good-sized wife, swept clean as a whistle, just like a floor. No snake could slink within thirty yards of the steps without being spotted by her hoe. She came out of the house to meet him with a smile, as she often did, and he handed her the pail with Kaya's smoked fish. "'What's this?' she asked. "'Looks like something even dogs wouldn't drag in. "'It's that girl again. Miss Kaya brung em. "'Sometimes she ain't the first one with muscles, so she's gone to smoke and fish. "'Wants me to sell em. "'Lord, we gotta do something about that child. "'Ain't nobody gonna buy them fish. "'I, can't, I can cook em up in a stew. "'Our church can come up with some clothes, other things for her. We'll tell her there's some family that'll trade jumpers for carpies. What size is she? You asking me? Skinny. All I know is she's skinny as a tick on a flagpole. I spec she'll be here first thing in the morning. She's plumb broke. After eating a breakfast of warmed up mussels and grits, Kaya motored over to Jumpin's to see if any money had come in from the smoked fish. In all these years it had just been him there, or customers, but as she approached slowly, she saw a large black woman sweeping the wharf like it was a kitchen floor. Jumpin was sitting in his chair, leaning it back against the store wall, doing figures on his ledger. Seeing her, he jumped up and waved. Good morning, she said quietly, drifting expertly up to the dock. Hiya, Miss Kaya. Got somebody here for you to meet. This is my wife, Mabel. Mabel walked up and stood next to Jumpin so that when Kaya stepped onto the wharf, they were close. Mabel reached out and took Kaya's hand, held it gently in hers and said, It's mighty fine to meet you, Miss Kaya. Jumpin's told me what a fine girl you are, one of the best oyster pickers. In spite of hoeing her garden, cooking half of every day, and scrubbing and mending for whites, Mabel's hands were supple. Kaya kept her fingers in that velvet glove, but didn't know what to say so stood quiet. 
Now, Miss Kaya, we got a family who'll trade clothes and other stuff you need for your smoked fish. Kaya nodded, smiled at her feet, then asked, What about gas for my boat? Mabel turned to question eyes at Jumpin. Well now, he said, I'll give you some today because I know you're short, but you keep bringing in mussels and such when you can. Mabel said in her big voice, Lord child, let's, let's don't worry none about the details. Now come let me look at you. I've got to calculate your size to tell them. She led her into the tiny shop. Let's sit right here and you tell me what clothes and what's all else you need. After they discussed the list, Mabel traced Kaya's feet on a piece of brown paper bag, then said, Well, come back tomorrow and there'll be a stack here for you. I'm much obliged, Mabel. Then her voice low said, There's something else. I found these old packages of seeds, but I don't know much about gardening. Well now, Marble leaned back and laughed deep in her generous bosom. I can sure do a garden. She went over every step in great detail, then reached back into some cans on the shelf and brought out squash, tomato and pumpkin seeds. She folded each kind into some paper and drew a picture of the vegetable on the outside. Kaya didn't know if Mabel did this because she couldn't write or because she knew Kaya couldn't read, but it worked fine for the both of them. She thanked them as she stepped into her boat. I'm glad to help you, Miss Kaya. Now you come back tomorrow for your things, Mabel said. That very afternoon, Kaya started hoeing the rows where Ma's garden used to be. The hoe made clunking sounds as it moved down the rows, releasing earthy smells and uprooting pinkish worms. Then a different clink sounded, and Kaya bent to uncover one of Ma's metal and plastic barrettes. She swiped it gently against her overalls until all the grit fell clear, as if reflected in the cheap artefact, Ma's red mouth and dark eyes were clearer than they had been in years. Kaya looked around. Surely Ma was walking up the lane, even now, come to help turn this earth, finally home. Such stillness was rare. Even the crows were quiet, and she could hear her own breathing. Sweeping up bunches of her hair, she pinned the barrette over her left ear. Maybe Ma was never coming home. Maybe some dreams should just fade away. She lifted the hoe and clobbered a chunk of hard clay into smithereens. When Kaya motored up to Jumpin's Wharf the next morning, he was alone. Perhaps the large form of his wife and her fine ideas had been an illusion. But there, sitting on the wharf, were two boxes of goods that Jumpin was pointing to, a wide grin on his face. Good morning, Miss Kaya. This here's for ya. Kaya jumped onto the wharf and stared at the overflowing crates. Go on then, Jumpin said. It's all yours. Gently, she pulled out overalls, jeans and real blouses, not just t-shirts, a pair of navy blue lace-up keds and some buster brown two-tone saddle shoes, polished brown and white so many times they glowed. Kaya held up a white blouse with a lace collar and a blue satin bow at the neck. Her mouth opened a little bit. The other box had matches, grits, a tub of oleo, dried beans and a whole quart of homemade lard. On top, wrapped in a newspaper, were fresh turnips and greens, rutabagas and okra. Jumpin, she said softly, this is more than those fish would have cost. This could be a month of fish. Well now, what are folks going to do with old clothes laying around the house? If they got these things extra and you need them and you got fish and they need fish, then what's the deal? You gotta take him now, cause I ain't got no room for that junk round here. Kaya knew that was true. Jumpin' had no extra space, so she'd be doing him a favour to take them off his wharf. I'll take them then, but tell them thank you, will you? And I'll smoke more fish and bring it in and bring it in as soon as I can. Okay then, Kaya, that'll be fine. You bring in your fish when you get them. Kaya chugged back into the sea. Once she rounded the peninsula, out of sight of Jumpin's, she idled down, dug in the box and pulled out the blouse with the lace collar. She put it on right over her scratchy bib overalls and patched knees. 
and tied the little satin ribbon into a bow around her neck. Then, one hand on the tiller, the other on the lace, she glided across ocean and estuaries toward home. Chapter 13 Feathers 1960 Lanky yet brawny for fourteen, Caius stood on an afternoon beach, flinging crumbs to gulls. Still couldn't count them, still couldn't read. No longer did she daydream of winging with eagles. Perhaps when you have to pour your supper from mud, imagination flattens to that of adulthood. Ma's sundress fit snugly ac across her breasts and fell just below her knees. She reckoned she had caught up and then some. She walked back to the shack, got a pole and line, and went straight to fishing from a thicket on the far side of her lagoon. Just as she cast, a stick snapped behind her. She jerked her head around searching. A footfall in brush. Not a bear, whose large paws squished in debris, but a solid clunk in the brambles. Then the crows cawed. Crows can't keep secrets any better than mud. Once they see something curious in the forest, they have to tell everybody. Those who listen are rewarded, either warned of predators or alerted to food. Kaya knew something was up. She pulled in the line, wrapped it around the pole even as she pushed silently through the brush with her shoulders, stopped again, listened. A dark clearing, one of her favourite places, spread cavern-like under five oaks so dense only hazy streams of sunlight filtered through the canopy, striking lush patches of trillium and white violets. Her eyes scanned the clearing but saw no one. Then a shape slunk through a thicket beyond, and her eyes swung there. It stopped. Her heart pumped harder. She hunkered down, stoop running fast and quiet into the undergrowth on the edge of the clearing. Looking back through the branches, she saw an older boy walking fast through the woods, his head moving to and fro. He stopped when he saw her. Kaya ducked behind a thorn bush, then squeezed into a rabbit run that twisted through brambles thick as a fort wall. Still bent, she scrambled, scratching her arms on prickly scrub, paused again, listening. Hid there in burning heat, her throat racking from thirst. After ten minutes, no one came, so she crept to a spring that pooled in moss and drank like a deer. She wondered who that boy was and why he'd come. That was the thing about going to Jumpin's. People saw her there. Like the underbelly of a porcupine, she was exposed. Finally, between dusk and dark, that time when shadows were unsure, she walked back toward the shack by way of the oak clearing. Because of him sneaking round, I didn't catch any of the fish to smoke. In the centre of the clearing was a rotted down stump, so carpeted in moss it looked like an old man hiding under a cape. Kaya approached it, then stopped. Lodged in the stump and sticking straight up was a thin black feather about five or six inches long. To most it would have looked ordinary, maybe a crow's wing feather but she knew it was extraordinary, for it was the eyebrow of a great blue heron, the feather that bows gracefully above the eye extending back beyond her elegant head, one of the most exquisite fragments of the coastal marsh right here. She had never found one, but knew instantly, instantly what it was, having squatted eye to eye with herons all her life. A great blue heron is the colour of grey mist reflecting in blue water, and like mist she can fade into the, black, into the backdrop, all of her disappearing except those concentric circles of her lock and load eyes. She is a patient, solitary hunter, standing alone as long as it takes her to snatch prey. Or, eyeing her catch, she will stride forward one step at a time like a predacious bridesmaid, and yet, on rare occasions, she hunts on the wing, darting and diving sharply, sword-like beak in the lead. How did it get stuck straight up in the stump? Whispering, Kaya looked around. That boy must have put it here. He could be watching me right now. She stood still, heart pounding again. 
Backing away, she left the feather and ran to the shack and locked the screen door, which she seldom did since it offered scant protection. Yet, as soon as dawn crept behind the trees, she felt a strong pull toward the feather, at least to look at it again. At sunrise, she ran to the clearing, looked around carefully, then walked to the stump and lifted the feather. It was sleek, almost velvety. Back, in the, back at the shack, she found a special place for it, in the centre of her collection, from tiny hummingbird feathers to large eagle tails that winged across the wall. She wondered why a boy would bring her a feather. The next morning, Kaya wanted to rush to the stump to see if another one had been left, but she made herself wait. She must not run into the boy. Finally, in late morning, she walked to the clearing, approaching slowly, listening. She didn't hear or see anybody, so she stepped forward and a rare, brief smile lit her face when she saw a thin white feather stuck into the top of the stump. It reached from her fingertips to her elbow and curved gracefully to a slender point. She lifted it and laughed out loud. A magnificent tail feather of a tropic bird. She'd never seen those but these seabirds because they didn't occur in this region, but on rare occasions they were blown over land on hurricane wings. Kaya's heart filled with wonder that someone had such a collection of rare feathers that he could spare this one. Since she couldn't read Ma's old guidebook, she didn't know the names of most birds of, or insects, so made up her own. And even though she couldn't write, Kaya had found a way to label her specimens. Her talent had matured and now she could draw, paint and sketch anything. Using chalks or watercolours from the five and dime, she sketched the birds, insects or shells on grocery bags and attached them to her samples. That night she splurged and lit two candles and set them in saucers on the kitchen table so she could see all the colours of the white, so she could paint the tropic bird feather. For more than a week there was no feather on the stump. Kaya went by several times a day, cautiously peeping through ferns, but saw nothing. She sat in the cabin in midday, something she rarely did. Should have soaked beans for supper. Now it's too late. She walked through the kitchen, rummaging through the cupboard, drumming her fingers on the table, thought of painting but didn't, walked again to the, to the stump. Even for some distance she could see a long, striped tail feather of a wild turkey. It caught her up. Turkeys have been one of her favourites. She watched as many as twelve chicks tuck themselves under the mother's wings even as the hen walked along, a few tumbling out the back, then scrambling to catch up. But about a year ago, as Kaya strolled through the stand of pines, she'd heard a high-pitched shriek. A flock of fifteen wild turkeys, mostly hens and a few toms and jakes, rushed about, pecking what looked like an oil rag crumpled in the dirt. Dust stirred from their feet and shrouded the woods, drifting up through the branches caught there. As Kaya had crept closer, she saw it was a hen turkey on the ground, and the birds of her own flock were pecking and toe-scratching her neck and head. She'd somehow managed to get her wings so tangled with briars, her feathers stuck out at strange, at strange angles and she could no longer fly. Jody had said that if a bird becomes different from the others... Disfigured or wounded, it was more likely to attract a predator, so the rest of the flock will kill it, which is better than drawing in an eagle who might take one of them in the bargain. A large female clawed at the, at the bedraggled hen in her, with her large horny feet, then pinned her to the ground as another female jabbed her with her naked neck and head. The hen squealed, looked around with wild eyes at her own flock assaulting her, Kaya ran into the clearing, throwing her arms around. Hey, what are you doing? Get out of here! Stop it! The flurry of wings kicked up more dust as the turkeys scattered into brush, two of them flying he heavy into oak. But Kaya was too late. The hen, her eyes wide open, lay limp, 
blood ran from her wrinkled neck, bent crooked on the dirt. Shoo, go on! Kaya chased the last of the large birds until they shuffled away, their business complete. She knelt next to the dead hen and covered the bird's eyes with a sycamore leaf. That night, after watching the turkeys, she ate a supper of leftover cornbread and beans, then lay on her porch bed, watching the moon touch the lagoon. Suddenly, she heard voices in the woods coming toward the shack. They sounded nervous, squeaky. Boys, not men. She sat straight up. There was no back door. It was get out now or still be sitting on the bed when they came. Quick as a mouse, she slipped to the door. But then, but just then, candles appeared, moving up and down, their light jiggling in halos, too late to run. Their voices got louder. Here we come, Marsh girl. Hey, you in there, Miss Miss and Link? Show us your teeth, show us your swamp grass. Pearls of laughter. She ducked lower behind the half wall of the porch as the footsteps moved closer. The flames flickered madly, then went out altogether as five boys, maybe 13 or 14 years old, ran across the yard. All talking stopped as they galloped full speed to the porch and tagged the door with their palms, making slapping sounds. Every smack a stab in the turkey hen's heart. Against the wall, Kaya wanted to whimper but held her breath. They could break through the door easy. One hard yank and they'd be in. But they backed down the steps, ran into the trees again, hooting and hollering with relief that they had survived the marsh girl, the wolf child, the girl who can't spell dog. Their words and laughter carried back to her through the forest as they disappeared into the night, back to safety. She watched the relit candles bobbing through the trees, then sat staring into the stone quiet darkness, shamed. Kaya thought of that day and night whenever she saw wild turkeys, but she was thrilled to see the feather t- the tail feather on the stump, just to know the game was still on. <laughs>